This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. In 1976, I had the privilege of taking a trip to the Bible lands, and that was a trip of a lifetime. It may be that some of you that are watching now have been there several times, but I've not had that opportunity, only one trip. But I think about it often as I'm studying the Bible and I study about different places in the Bible. But I believe the highlight of the entire trip was the day that after we had seen the ruins of where the city of Capernaum used to be, that the guide took us to the site over the Sea of Galilee on a little slope there, and we were sitting there, and he began to explain that it was somewhere in that region that Jesus sat down and taught the greatest sermon that has ever been delivered, and we refer to it as the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be discussing a, a series of lessons entitled Moments on the Mount. And in that series, we're going to be talking about the Beatitudes of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Billy Lambert, and I'm the speaker on Getting to Know Your Bible, and I, I want to welcome you today, and please stay tuned as we discuss Moments on the Mount. Now, in Getting to Know Your Bible, we offer a free Bible correspondence course and in order that you might know more about the course, we're going to pause for just a moment. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible Correspondence Course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580. Or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. I'd like to read now from Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse number six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus, in the Beatitudes that he gave in Matthew chapter five, is now talking about hungering and thirsting. You know, all of us need more than just something to eat, don't we? Even Jesus said that in Matthew 4 and 4 when he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, we need sustenance for the soul. In 1 Peter 2, Peter talked about the need for having a desire for the sincere milk of the Word. That's the Word of God. And I think the key word there is desire. We ought to have a desire for, for the Word of God. But it's important for a person to be hungry, and it's important for a person to have a thirst. You see, that's a sign of life because dead people don't need any food. Dead people don't drink any water. And extreme hunger can lead to death. So it's important for us to hunger and thirst. But that's also signs of spiritual life. When you don't have an appetite for those things that are spiritual in nature, that, that's a dangerous signal. That there's a signal that there's something wrong in our spiritual man. Because it's normal to crave food. I mentioned 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. And that's where Peter said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. When we become new babes in Christ, when we've been born again, we begin to live the life of a Christian, we are to have a desire 
for the sincere milk of the word. We're to crave spiritual food. And that's a sign of a normal, healthy life. And a loss of appetite physically is, is a red flag. Just suppose that one of your children just got to the point that they didn't want to eat anymore. That they had a loss of their appetite. And I, I remember a time in my life as a teenager that I, that I didn't want to eat. And my parents knew that if, that if I wasn't eating, something had to be wrong because I had a very good appetite normally. And they took me to the doctor, and sure enough, they found out what was wrong, and it was corrected, and then I began to, to eat again, and I began to, ga to gain weight again, unfortunately, and, and it's been that way ever since. And, and so we need to have a desire for things that are spiritual. And it's a matter of life and death when it comes to our spiritual life. We are to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And without the desire, the hunger and thirst for righteousness, we really don't have the motivation to live for Jesus Christ. So we need to hunger and thirst for spiritual food and for righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous, though? I heard a preacher by the name of Guy N. Woods, who was a Bible scholar, uh, and, and he gave this very simple definition of righteousness. He was very capable of giving a very detailed, in-depth uh, study of it, but he gave this simple, simple, very simple definition of what it means to be righteous. He said it just means to do right. And we are need to hunger and thirst for, the, for, the, for, for just doing right in our lives. I'm afraid that so many people have lost their hunger for that. We need to, to have an appetite doing things that are right, not just in the sight of man. We need to have a, a, a desire to do what is right in the sight of God. I think of a passage in the Old Testament about righteousness. Psalms 119, verse, verse 172. And there the psalmist said, All your commandments are righteousness. Well, when we do what God says, we're living a righteous life. And so Jesus said, Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, some people are self-righteous. They're self-righteous. And I think when I think about a self-righteous person, I think about the Pharisee in the 18th chapter of Luke who, who thought that he was better than the publican. We're not talking about uh, that I feel like I'm better than others' attitude. That's self-righteousness. And then I think about the, the people in Luke, the 15th chapter, who were looking down on Jesus because Jesus associated with publicans and sinners. And then that's when Jesus taught parables about those that were lost, trying to emphasize the importance and the value of that which is lost. And so we're not talking about self-righteousness. Well, I feel like I'm better than other people, that I'm good enough like I am. I have talked to people about their souls, and I've had them to tell me, I think I'm all right just like I am. And the fact is, you're not all right like you are without Jesus. And I would hope that we would all feel that way. To be self-righteous is sort of like the Pharisees and and if you want to think about a group of people that were self-righteous, they were the 23rd chapter of Matthew is where Jesus is talking about the Pharisees of his day. And listen to his analysis of them. Number one, they were sitting in Moses' seat 
and they would say and do not. They would tell you what you needed to do, but they wouldn't do it themselves. That they, they would bind heavy burdens on you, but they wouldn't move one of those burdens with their little finger. And they were so self-righteous. They loved to have the chief seats. And they loved to be seen of men. When we begin to think that I'm better than others, when we get to the point that I think that I'm okay like I am without Jesus, we're just like filthy rags to God. Rags that need to be cleansed with the cleansing blood of Jesus. We are not all right without Jesus. But self-righteousness is not what we're talking about. We're talking about righteousness. And righteousness can be defined as integrity. Integrity. And the best way I know to describe integrity is that it's Honesty, being honest about things. Some people have no integrity because it's been proven that they're like the Pharisees. They'll tell you what to do. They won't do it. Or they are dishonest people. They have no integrity. A thief has no integrity. Righteousness is purity. Righteousness is correct thinking. Righteousness is doing right. And we will never be righteous without Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul said that righteousness is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. He made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we should be made, what? The righteousness of God where? In Him. The only way we'll ever be made righteous is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we're in Jesus, we have salvation. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ. We're righteous in Christ. We're saved in Christ. We're new creatures in Jesus. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old oh, things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So it is in him that we're made righteous. Someone says, well, what do you think about Jesus' righteousness? He was righteousness personified. And that we just partake of His righteousness. We're made righteous in Christ. We're made righteous because we obey the gospel by believing on Jesus, repenting of our sins. You can't be made righteous unless you turn away from the sin in your life. And I've often thought that the most difficult thing to do before a person can be made righteous in Jesus Christ is to turn away from their sins. Because sin is a monster. And sin wants to keep you in its grasp. But we must turn away from those sins. And as a penitent, confessing believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are immersed into Jesus Christ that we might put Christ on in baptism. Someone says, that, that's not in the Bible, is it, preacher? Well, let me read to you from the third chapter of Galatians, verses 26 20, and verse 27. For you're all the children of God. How? By faith, where? In Christ Jesus. Well, if we're children of God by faith in Christ, how does one put on Christ? How do I get into Jesus Christ? For as many of you, this is verse 27, as have been 
baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. So we're made righteous in Christ. We're made righteous because we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans, the sixth chapter, Paul begins that chapter by saying, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. We put Christ on when we're baptized into him. Someone says, well, what happens when you're baptized? Well, let's read Acts twenty two sixteen. And now why tarry us thou, arise and be baptized. What happens when you're baptized? And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And that's just what the Bible teaches about that matter. I want to, put, I want to know I'm in Jesus Christ. And when I've obeyed Christ by dying to sin, being buried with Christ in baptism, I'm raised to walk in the newness of life. I know that I've been made righteous in Him. Someone says, how do you know that? Well, I call your attention now to Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You become the servants of doing what's right. You become the servant of obeying God and not obeying the devil. You became a servant of God Almighty instead of a servant of Satan himself. And when you do that, you obey that form of doctrine. A form of what doctrine? A form of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ, but dying to sin, being buried with Jesus in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life, and then we're made Free from sin. Free from sin when? What does Paul say about being made free from sin? He said being then made free from sin. Sin when? When you have obeyed that form of doctrine that was delivered you. And that's what he taught in the first six verses of Romans the sixth chapter. That's when we're made righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to hunger and thirst after that which is right. Now let me tell you some of the marks of the righteous man. First of all, he has a right attitude towards stuff. Or somebody says, what do you mean, Brother Lambert? You know, in America, we have so much stuff. We don't have a place to store it all. We have storage buildings in the backyard full of stuff. We go downtown and we rent a storage building so we can put stuff in there that we don't need. We have so much th stuff or things. But when you are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, then you have the right attitude toward the things of life. And Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where rust does not corrupt and where moths do not eat and then thieves do not break through and steal. But you know what Jesus said? Instead of laying up treasure here on this earth, lay up your, your treasures in heaven. But so many people are laying up treasures in heaven. But you see, when I'm hungering and thirsting after righteousness, then I have the right attitude or the right affection toward things. And then I have the right master. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters. He that he will hate the one and love the other, hold the one, and despise the other, you cannot serve God and mammon, and mammon is money. And when we have the, uh, our desire is to live a right life before God, a righteous life before God, when we're hungering and thirsting for that, then we have a desire to do what is right, and we have the right master. And Jesus is our master. 
I read it. There's a passage in the fourth chapter of Colossians says that you have a master in heaven. And indeed we do have a master in heaven. And our master's in heaven. And our master is not Satan. Because we've broke, broken off a relationship with him. And the only relationship that I have with the devil now is a warring relationship with Satan. I'm hungering and thirsting to do what's right in God's sight. And to be filled with that desire, to be filled with that desire, we've got to hunger and thirst for certain things. To hunger and thirst after righteousness. I I need to hunger and thirst for the presence of God in my life. Do you believe that God is present in your life? Well, the Lord said in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now, we've been going through some difficult times. Many of you have had to stay confined to quarters, so to speak, for a long time. And some of you may be confined now to a hospital bed. So some of you that are, that are watching right now or listening right now may be in a prison cell. So some of you may be driving your automobile, listening right now on your radio. But I want you to know that God is not an absent God. You know, the deists believe that God created everything and then left us alone. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. When Moses took over the reins of leadership, or rather Joshua took over the reins of leadership after the death of Moses, he may have been wondering, am I up to the task? But in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5, this is what the Lord told Joshua. As I will was Moses, I will be with thee. And I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. And that's the God of the Bible. A never failing God and a God who never forsakes us. Listen to Hebrews again. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And when we have problems, God is there to help us through all of those problems. We've got to ask for help. In 1 Peter 5 and 7, the Bible says, Casting all of your care on Him. For He he cares for you. And you just keep on casting. Because He always keeps on caring for you. He never ceases to care. He's He's a never, never forsaking God. A never failing God. And we need to be filled with a hunger and thirst for His presence in our lives. And we also need to hunger and thirst for His power. Paul said in Ephesians, the third chapter, that He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. I'm hungry for that, aren't you? I'm thirsting for that kind of power in my life. God is a powerful God. And He's able to do some great things. And He's able to do more than we think. He's able to do more than we even ask Him to do. Sometimes I am in awe at the greatness and the power of God. We need to hunger and thirst for the the daily provisions that God gives to us. God provides for us, His people. But He has to come in the right place in our lives. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Do you remember the the definition of righteousness in the Psalms? All your commandments are righteousness. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and His commandments his righteousness to keep all of God, what God tells us to do. 
He's not looking for partial obedience in our lives. He wants our lives totally surrendered to him and his will. We need to be, be like Jesus in that regard. Not my will, but thine be done. I think when we come to the point in our lives that we, that we are humble enough in our life and in our spirit that I, we realize how much we need God in our lives every day. And, and if there was ever a time we needed God in our lives and we are hungering and thirsting for something in our lives, something missing, and that thing that's missing could be Jesus in your life. I think I'm talking to someone right now who feels a void in their life. There's a void in your life. That there's, a, there's something gnawing on the inside of you. You just don't really know what it is right now. But it just may be that you've not been hungering and thirsting for the right thing. Have a hunger and thirst to do what's right. And I want to encourage you to take three steps. Step number one, step out of self. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. You've got to step out of yourself. And take yourself off the throne of your heart. Put Jesus on that throne. Number two, step into Christ. Be baptized into Christ. For all spiritual blessings are to be found. Ephesians 1, 3. And then when it comes your time to leave this old world, you'll take that third step. And that step will be up to heaven. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And it will be that way for you as well. Live your life for Jesus and give your life to him. But you know, you're the one that has to make that choice, that decision. I can't make that for you. And if there are those of you that have been studying along with our Bible course and you've made your decision, that you'd like to put Christ on, Call us, we'll assist you in doing that. And if you have never visited the Church of Christ, may I give you a personal invitation to visit it, the one there in your community and also right now in the closing moments, may I in, urge you to pick up the telephone right now, call for the Bible course, or you can take it online as well. But however you do it, please, please take the Bible correspondence course. We want to make it available to you free of charge. I want to thank you for watching today, and we love you. And until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible. P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580 or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.